I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Pat O'Reardon, who is uh, from Glanbia, uh, my own company that I worked for many years ago, but it's now much bigger and better. And Pat is going to talk about innovation and Glanbia, and Pat is the Chief Science and Technology Officer uh, with Glanbia. So, Pat. Great, thank you very much, uh, Dennis, and uh, thanks for inviting me to the event as well. Uh, I think we've tinned out a bit um, in the late afternoon, so thank you guys for, for hanging around and, uh, um, and, and coming to the talk. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, three strategic uh, challenges uh, for innovation. Um, uh, and I think it's, it's actually applicable to any company, irrespective of the industry that you're in. So hopefully you'll get something um, out of this talk. But it's certainly the way we're thinking about innovation from a strategic point of view, anyway, in, in Glambia. Uh, so Glambia, is, um, our vision is to be the leading uh, global performance uh, nutrition and ingredients group. Uh, and we've been on that journey for a number of years now. So this chart just shows uh, margin expansion in the group um, over the last 15 years or so. Uh, so you can see it going from about 3.4% up to about um, 8% um, on, a, on a total group level. Um, so it's been quite a, a transformative um, journey for the group. Um, and really, you know, the margin and the revenue has expanded as we've got into higher margin, higher growth, more stable and um, value-added uh, sectors of, uh, of the industry. Um, and I think this is a kind of really as a backdrop to uh, my presentation, just to talk about this idea of continuously uh, defining what industry you're in um, and continuously transforming the business then, particularly through innovation, which is really underpinning um, a lot of what you see here. Um, this is just in, in terms of how we're structured today. So um, key part, I guess, here is that we have uh, two global growth uh, platforms. So we have uh, Global Performance Nutrition, uh, and we're the industry leader in that uh, B2C sector. So we have some of the leading brands in that area, um, and, and they're uh, global brands. Uh, and we also have um, a global ingredients business then as well, and we're market leaders across a number of market sectors um, in that area, particularly around the whey and uh, protein areas. Um, we're lucky enough as a, as a business to be involved in, um, I guess, are at the center of some um, uh, very interesting and emerging trends, particularly in the area of health and well-being, um, improved lifestyles, um, also looking as well at uh, things like sustainability, traceability of food products, clean label ingredients, um, that sort of thing. So we're quite lucky um, in terms of where we're currently positioned and, um, and how we can leverage some of our technologies. Um, this is just our R&D uh, footprint, so we have um, a number of R&D centers uh, globally. So we have two, um, of our, sorry, we have a number of major R&D centers in, in the US and also in Ireland. Um, so that's four in total, so two in Ireland and two in the US. Uh, and then we also have a number of local formulation um, um, areas then as well scattered around the globe. So but we have a significant presence um, in Ireland, Europe, and also, of course, in the US. I um, just wanted to touch on the, um, our involvement in the dairy um, uh, R&D innovation ecosystem here in Ireland. So we're, we're an active player in that area, um, of course. Uh, and we've been kind of, I guess, one of the founding members of most of the, uh, the significant um, uh, private-public uh, partnership programs uh, that you can see along the bottom there. So this is particularly important to us in terms of developing the underpinning science and technology uh, to all allow us to, um, uh, to move our, our, our ingredient and performance nutrition platforms um, forward. Um, so this is just kind of getting into the meat of, um, of the discussion, and this actually comes back to the role of um, R&D innovation. Um, I was very intrigued this morning by, um, uh, by both Richard and Rory, the talk uh, that they had, particularly in terms of this idea of um, output versus um, outcomes. And I think from an industry point of view, nowhere can that, that idea be captured better than, um, uh, than these particular guys here. So I usually ask, does anybody in the audience know what this building is? Uh, but because of time, I'll just tell you, this is actually uh, Kodak Heights, or what remains of Kodak Heights in, uh, in Mount Dennis in Ontario, uh, in Canada. Um, so this was the center of uh, Kodak's operations up until about 2006, and this is building number, number nine of 12 that remains uh, today. 
Um, so everybody knows the story with Kodak in terms of being disrupted by digital photography. Um, but actually, if you go a bit deeper into the Kodak story, you can actually see how they really bundled um, uh, innovation, R&D, and strategy from a business point of view. Um, so Kodak actually invented the digital camera in 1975. Uh, and between the years of 1990 and 1999, uh, they created a total of, um, it was just over 19,500 patents, uh, 1,000 of which were in digital photography more than any other company um, in the world. So they actually saw digital photo photography coming. Uh, they enabled a lot of the science and technology behind digital photography. But the problem with Kodak, as with a lot of companies, is that they fell in love with film and chemicals uh, too much. Uh, the profit margins in that part of the business were about 60% uh, versus something like 15% in digital photography. Of course, the rest is history, and, and this is kind of where they've ended up um, today. So I think that's an important backdrop, really, to kind of looking at these uh, strategic challenges uh, for innovation. Um, and I guess the, it really comes down to kind of the role of innovation, the way I see it anyway at least, is defining uh, what industry um, you're in uh, and what you're trying to achieve within those particular industries. So I'll actually use um, uh, the railroad industry as a, as a kind of an example of this. Um, so I guess um, railroads, um, because it, you know, when they originally um, came about, they defined themselves as, from a product point of view as being in the train um, industry. Uh, and because they did that, then they were blindsided, blindsided by the, the advent of, uh, of automobiles and, and trains, uh, or sorry, and planes in particular. Um, and then also they neglected to leverage their right of way, um, I guess, for the creation of, um, of new types of industries. And the right of way I'm talking about here is really the, the ground underneath the tracks and that they had linking port to port, uh, and also the air above the tracks then as well. And, and this was actually eventually leveraged first and foremost by the telegraph industry and later by the telephone industry. And today we have the telecommunication, fiber optics and things like that that were now running along what were uh, the original train lines in places like the US. Um, so they, because they defined themselves from a product perspective, they, they really saw themselves as just being in the train um, industry and ignored kind of everything else. Um, I think had they defined themselves from a consumer or from a customer point of view, um, they would have actually seen um, a second industry emerging, which is more around service, and actually they could have defined it themselves as being in a transportation industry. Um, and then, you know, if they had abstracted that a bit further, they would have seen the advent of, um, of consumer experience in particular and actually define themselves potentially as being in the communication industry. Um, so I think that's the first and, and foremost, the most important and, uh, challenge for innovation um, is defining what industry you're actually in. Um, so we use these terms called lead, reshape and uh, create. So lead is all about leading within the industry that we're currently uh, playing in. Um, shape or reshaping is about reinventing how we do the industry today. And uh, so that's making sure that we're not blindsided by the advent of new technologies that can disrupt what we're already doing. And creating is about understanding what right of way do we have today and how can we partner um, with new people to actually leverage that right away to create new forms of growth and new forms of, um, of industry. So it's always a kind of, I guess, from a strategic point of view, a paranoia about uh, defining uh, the industry. The, uh, and, you know, when it comes then to, to Glambia, from a strategic point of view, we talk about innovation uh, proficiency. Uh, and going back to what I just said, we talk about the idea of market-led and technology-driven uh, and a growth system that's, uh, that's continuous and predictable then as well. Um, market-led is important here because it means defining ourselves in terms of the needs and wants of our customers uh, and our consumers, and then we use the right technologies to be able to deliver value-added um, uh, solutions uh, to those folks. <clears throat> so the, um, I guess part of that innovation proficiency, two things I'm going to touch upon. Number one is the idea of innovation portfolio management, and the other idea is actually how do we define and manage innovation projects uh, themselves. So when we talk about innovation portfolio management, this is the kind of the portfolio that we use within the business. Uh, and we actually, on this uh, matrix here, we, 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 we basically position those innovations that we're pursuing, projects that we're pursuing, so we can use bubble sizes in terms of revenue size and that type of thing. But again, going back to these kind of key challenges for innovation, um, what, what particularly what I'm concerned about is the idea of lead. So, how can we you know, uh, reinforce um, uh, sustainable or incremental type innovation, so lead within the industries within which we're already playing? 
Um, then also, how can we reinvent perhaps what we're currently doing today? So to make sure that we're not blindsided, as I said before, by new technologies. So how this is really the, uh, the transportation um, part of the, the train um, um, model that I talked about. And finally, then, is about um, this idea of creating uh, new businesses by leveraging our right of way. So understanding what types of right of way uh, we have as a business, how we define that, and then how we can partner with new people um, in a reciprocity type model to, um, uh, to create new industries. So all of our business units would have these types of uh, portfolios and we would look at um, the shape of those portfolios and do we have the right shape um, uh, and the right number of initiatives, et cetera, in the right boxes to be able to deliver on the strategic promise that we're making from an innovation point of view. And then we're able to ladder that up to a, a group perspective um, as well. The next important part then is actually how do we define innovation? And um, you know, I worked in innovation for about um, uh, 15 or 16 years now, and um, this is what I'm talking about here is really kind of, I guess, a design thinking approach to, um, to innovation, or what we call a user-centered design approach, which is becoming part of the vernacular now, particularly in places like the US. Um, so we look at innovation through three lenses. Um, so we talk about the idea of uh, desirability. So in terms of understanding what the market needs, what our customer needs, what our consumer needs. We talk about feasibility from a technical point of view. So do we have the ability to produce um, what the market desires? Um, and then we talk about the viability. So can we create a business case around that? Um, it sounds simple, but actually it's... Um, uh, what you find in a lot of uh, businesses that I've spoken to in particular is that they tend to define innovation purely through a feasibility lens without really thinking about the desirability or the viability aspects. So we would look at um, all the innovation projects that we pursue from really from inception all the way through to commercialization through these three lenses. Um, and that, I think, really makes a difference um, from an innovation performance perspective. This just gives you um, an example of that, brings it to life from a performance nutrition point of view with a, a product that we recently launched um, called um, uh, Gold Standard. Um, it's a pre-workout product that we launched in the States. So we, in this case, we used, um, it was a user-centered approach. So starting from a desirability point of view, um, co-creating the product with our users, um, developing the right types of technology to match that need in the marketplace, and then to make sure that we, whatever we created, actually we could make a, a business out of it. Um, so it was both incremental in terms of revenue and also um, had a margin expanding effect then as well. Um, so that just brings it to, to life with one example from, from the business. Um, I guess the kind of the secret um, behind all of this and making innovation work is um, through these three lenses, we, actually, we ask one very, very simple question, but I think it's actually probably the most fundamental and important question that I've ever asked in my career in terms of innovation, particularly with those folks that I work with across those three lenses. So we say, you know, what would need to be true to make this a success from a, a desirability point of view, from a feasibility point of view, and from a viability point of view? And I, you'd be actually surprised, um, and I'm sure if you went back to your teams and asked them that question, to, you know, to define what needs to be true to make this successful, they would actually struggle at, um, at providing that definition. Um, because once you, did, once you start defining that, these are the assumptions that you start creating around innovation through each of those three lenses. Um, once we actually generate lists of assumptions across those three lenses, we say, okay, what do we need to, to know next uh, to move these projects forward? So we really focus on um, what we actually need to do versus what we'd like to do. Um, and, you know, as we all know, I guess the, um, uh, what we see happening an awful lot, particularly from an innovation perspective, is you get an awful lot of action around false assumptions. So we think we know um, what the answer is, but in fact, we don't know what the answer is and uh, we haven't tested it. And that's when it gets scary from an innovation um, uh, point of view. Um, so the, um, I guess going back to our innovation portfolio, then when I talk about lead shape and create, as we move out into the shape, reshape and create parts of um, our portfolio, then the number of assumptions obviously increases. And as the number of assumptions uh, to knowledge increases, then we have to design more experiments, we have to do more testing around those assumptions so to prove them correct. Uh, and we use this as actually an investment model then as well behind innovation. So we actually only invest behind those tests as opposed to investing um, 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 whole scale behind the whole innovation um, opportunity. Um, and this is something that's taken, some of you might be familiar with uh, the lean startup movement in the US, and um, this is taken from a guy called Steve Blank, and 
And it's the idea, again, it's a design thinking uh, kind of idea, using a feedback loop of, um, of really defining those assumptions, uh, going out, testing those assumptions, and then coming back and reshaping your assumptions and, uh, and moving forward. So really moving from an area of, um, of a high assumption to knowledge ratio to an area of a low assumption to knowledge ratio. And again, we would do that throughout the entire um, 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 development process when it comes to innovation. So when then we talk about um, partnerships, um, particularly with public institutions and things like this, we, we tend to view it more so through these three lenses, through the idea of um, desirability, feasibility, viability, why we get involved in these particular um, initiatives and what assumptions that these initiatives um, help us address and help us um, answer and, and test. Um, but I guess from my experience, one area that I've, I have learned is, um, you know, and when I talk to a lot of um, particularly public institutions around this type of thinking, they, they sometimes struggle with it, particularly in terms of the desirability and viability aspects um, of I innovation. So I think there's a lot of um, interesting learnings there. So just to conclude then, so um, just give you a quick kind of overview of uh, Glambia. Um, what we've done in Glambia in terms of elevating innovation to a strategic level in the organization, and then how we think about innovation in terms of its strategic role. So really about defining what industry um, we're in. Um, uh, within those industries, so, or sorry, using a customer versus a product and definition in terms of those industries. Um, and then also defining what right away we have um, to help us um, understand what kind of partnerships are out there uh, and who do we need to work with uh, to create new opportunities and new growth within the business. Um, and then we, this idea of innovation proficiency and going back to our innovation portfolio um, and again looking at lead, shape and create. So answering those kind of three fundamental questions um, for anybody involved in, in commercial innovation at least um, is really around kind of, you know, how do we keep the core punch? pumping um, in terms of incremental innovation. Um, how do we reinvent what we're currently doing? So to prevent us from being, um, 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 uh, I guess, uh, op obsoleted um, uh, with new technologies. And then finally looking at, um, again, going back to right away and creating um, uh, new businesses. And, and finally, I guess the going away message is that in, oops, innovation really lies at the, at the heart of those three lenses. It, it's not really from my point of view at least, anyway, grounded in, in feasibility or the technical aspects. We also have to consider the human aspect and, and also the business aspect in as well and make sure that they all marry up. So, um, so that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.